All right, third time's the charm. Um, let's hope that this time I don't get another phone call um, in the middle of what I'm doing. So what I'd like to look at is this infinite plane again. Um, this time I want to look at it with respect to um, Gauss's law. So um, last time you remember that I, ha I had this um, infinite uh, plane of uniform charge density and I was looking for its applied or its electric field um, and I used a Coulomb like integral right I used basically Coulomb's law for each and every um, little infinitesimal point in here um, to find the um, electric field everywhere in space so um, I'd like to I'd like to um, try that again, but this time I want to use Gauss's law. And partially the reason for that is I want to show you um, how much easier with Gauss's law it is to do this. Um, you, you know, anytime you have the right symmetries and you can and you notice that the um, situation has the right symmetries. So we've got this electric um, electric field that we're trying to find from this uh, infinite plane of uniform charge density. All right. And again, the concept behind this solution is Gauss's law. And Gauss's law I like to use in this sort of, co I like to write in this compact form, uh, the total um, charge enclosed in a surface is equal to the amount of flux through the surface times the permittivity of free space times a constant. Uh, wonderful. Okay, so, um, so so that's basically what we're going to do. Um, the strategy for using Gauss's law is uh, first we want to examine the symmetries, and that's going to be the long part of this. Um, you, you know, we've done this in class, or we will do this in class, depending on when you're looking at this. But probably you won't look at this before we do it in class. And um, if you look at my notes, in so you've also got my lecture notes. If you look at my lecture notes, it's like three very loose pages. They're very, very different from the um, pages that I normally have in those. Um, and that's because most of it's just discussion about general things. So what's going on with this? What's going on with that? And that's examining these symmetries. I mean, once we've examined those symmetries, you know, all we have to do is uh, choose a shape, right? Uh, which uh, which matches those symmetries, um, uh, and then we can um, basically find this flux. Uh, it's probably um, best to find the flux first most of the time because the flux, the um, the flux that we find for the shape isn't going to change as we change the size of the shape conceptually, right? Uh, but when we um, when we find the uh, charge. Right, when we find this total charge, um, oftentimes, and not, it's not going to be true in this case, but it was true in the last one that we looked at, um, at, the last one that we looked at in these videos, and it's going to be true for a lot of your homework problems that, um, depending on whether you're inside or outside of the, the material, so if you had a thick, a thick slab, for example, when your, when your shape was in here, your shape was completely in here, you'd get a different result than when your shape um, penetrated the surface, right, for the total amount of charge enclosed. You'd have a different functional form, is how we call it. And after we find that charge, right, then we can use Gauss's law to um, find the field. So it's pretty um, direct. The only um, complicated part is analyzing the symmetries. I shouldn't say complicated. That's the part where you think. So that's one of the reasons why we really like Gauss's Law. Uh, we like to teach Gauss's Law in Physics 3, in ENM, in Mechanics, if we had a Mechanics class. We really like to talk about Gauss's Law because it's really where you start thinking about what's going on in the problem. and just referring back to a bunch of equations doesn't help unless the book gives you too many equations and you don't ever have to think about it yourself. Um, so let's go ahead and examine these symmetries. And we'll examine the symmetries in cross-section. So we've got our infinite plane 
here. And then, you know, I want to find the field somewhere. So above or below, um, above or below the plane, I'll just put it out here. Um, and I'll have some intermediate point here that I'll call zero. So I'm going to worry about what happens uh, when I move this point around. So now this plane is infinite in both, ex in both directions and it's the same in both directions. It means that we have basically two kinds of symmetry. So oh, we've got two kinds of symmetries. We've got reflection symmetries. So we've got one reflection symmetry here that we'll use. We've got one reflection symmetry here, right? And we also have a translational symmetry, right? So um, I'll just go ahead and explain those. So basically, um, if we look at the situation here and we look at the situation down here, and the same is going to be true over here, um, this has to be the mirror image of that. So basically, if there's a field pointing this way, right, then the field is going to have to point this way over here. So, um, so whatever happens here, away from the, um, going away from this plane has to be the same as going away from the plane down here. So the what or the z components, excuse me, here have to be um, opposite. So um, using using this particular, uh, if we call this um, one and call this a, using this particular um, example, uh, e um, one z is equal to minus e. Um, a z and um, so it's for a and um, e one x is equal to e a x and e one y is equal to e a y. Okay, so e one z is equal to minus e a z and these other ones are exactly the same. Okay. So that's what happens here. I mean, really, we only see the x direction, let's say. But whatever we say for the x direction, um, because this is the same in all in all orientations, uh, we have to be able to say for the y direction. So that that's actually using the rotational symmetry by being able to say whatever is true for x is true for y as well. Um, so that's really the example, right? But the ones we're going to use here are going to be um, this reflection symmetry here, for example. So you see, um, if we um, come down here and we go a little bit over here, there is a bit of positive charge. And if we were way over here, right, and went down and looked over here, there'd be a bit of positive charge over there, right? And if we went over here and we went um, away and looked here, there'd be a bit of positive charge. If we went over here and went away, there'd be a bit of positive charge. It's, it's all exactly symmetric. Everything that you say here and going away, you can say about here going away. Anything here coming towards this plane, you can say about here coming towards this plane. So we know that if we're reflecting in the x-axis that E1z is equal to Eaz. Um, E1x um, is equal to minus Eax, or B, uh, this is B, excuse me, Bx. And E1y um, is equal to Eby. That's because we're reflecting, we're reflecting along the z-axis. Okay, we're along the z-axis through this xy plane here. So that's your xy plane. Right? Um, and we have one other thing, right? If we move up from here to here, then the same thing is true, right? If we move here and go into the negative direction, we have a bit of positive charge. Here in the negative direction, a bit of positive charge. Here, if we're here in a positive direction, a bit of positive charge. Here in the positive direction, a bit of positive charge. So the translational symmetry now also tells us something. So this one told us that um, we go like this. This one says, we, everything has to be the same in this direction. So um, C uh, tells us that E1z is equal to Ebz, right? Um, E1x is equal to Eb, or Cx, it's easy, Cx. And E1y um, is equal to Ecy. So if we put these two together, right, we say E1x 
is equal to minus EBX is equal to E to the CX, right? Um, all right. Actually, these are still at the same point B, so we can see we should have used that. B. So these two guys are equal, which means that if those are equal, they're equal to zero, so EX is equal to zero. And like I said previously, anything we say for X, we can say for Y because of the rotational symmetry, so EY is equal to zero, um, which means that the field is always going to be pointing in the Z direction, right? Okay, so now for Gauss's law, we want a shape that for each one of the um, for each one of the uh, faces is either um, perpendicular or parallel to the z direction. It's got to be perpendicular or parallel to this. Um, so it's either got to be um, perpendicular. So let's just draw something perpendicular here. Um, at, or parallel to uh, parallel to this plane. Um, on top of that, we remember that um, when we flip over here, this is negative. That's going to give us something else. So that means that that's going to say that whatever is coming out the flux here is going to be the flux there. We'll find find that out in a second. So um, we come up here, some amount z. We come down here, some amount z. And um, so we'll use a cylinder. Um, we we'll use this cylinder that is perpendicular to the plane. Okay. Um, now the flux uh, is phi e, right, and that's going to be equal to um, phi from the top, right, plus phi from the bottom, plus phi from the sides. Now, what we've just said is that these are um, well. These are um, E dot A, right? The flux is E dot A. A is the area times, and we have A is the area times the unit normal for this, and the unit normal is outward, right? So out, out, out. So um, phi T is going to be EZ in the Z hat direction dot the normal, which is Z dot. Um, and then we have phi b is minus e z, right, coming down here because of um, this here, minus e z in the z hat direction dot minus z hat, uh, plus um, whatever is going on here. This is actually the s hat direction. So we have um, e z in the z hat direction dot um, S hat. Actually, this has to be integrated um, over Z and Phi. Um, but this is zero because it's going this way, this is coming out. So that guy's zero, which means this total flux is 2EZ times the area. Yeah, got the areas. Okay. So um, 2 EZ times the area. So that's what's coming, coming through here, plus what's coming through here, plus the zero that's coming through around there, which it looks like a zero because it's a big circle. All right, so now we want to find the um, charge, right? Again, this isn't going to be really, really hard. We just care about what's in here. And because, because of the nice symmetries, because it's uniform, right? It's not necessarily going to be uniform in every problem, um, but it is in this one. Because it's uniform, um, our integral for the enclosed charge, right, which is, um, well, first we'd say it's a volume integral over rho dv, but because this is um, just in there, that's equal to a sigma dA, which is um, sigma times A. And this A is the same size as these, right? So um, sigma A is equal to that times epsilon naught which means that the field, or so if we use, let's just go with that, Q enclosed is equal to sigma A, 
this guy is equal to um, epsilon naught times 2EZA, right? A's are going to cancel. Uh, e is in the Z direction. So we have E is equal to um, uh, 1 over 2 epsilon naught times sigma in the z hat direction, which should be what we found in the last video when we looked at this last. So it's actually pretty much the same. Um, actually, we should have added the sign, right? Because when it's down here on the bottom, we've already said sign z. So the sign of that is actually it. So we end up with the same, um, the same result that we had previously only we don't have to really worry about carrying out all those intervals. Um, and we don't have to worry about the, um, the things that we looked at in the last one with the charge distribution. So this guy's a really, really easy way to do things as long as you're looking for symmetries. Um, and I do have a long and boring story if you want to come into my office and maybe I'll, I can pull out Jackson and I can talk about having an argument, argument with my professor in graduate school. Um, about, you know, that had to do with um, symmetries and stuff like that. But symmetries are wonderful, they're important, they make things easy, plus when you get into fund the fundamental physics of things, actually, they are really, really uh, the only way to go. So, I'll see you in class.